One of the questions that I get asked a lot is when do we start implementing AAC with the child? As soon as they're starting to communicate, you can start modeling different methods of communication. And I really encourage you to do that because sometimes it takes a bit of trial and error to find the system that your child responds best to and that um, really works for both your child and your family. It really depends on how severe your child is and how much they're able to communicate. I usually look at it as a frustration level. If your child is really frustrated and they really are trying to communicate, we want to give them every method that we can until their speech is able to be used reliably for them to communicate. So you can start, uh, you know, 12 months, 18 months modeling different AAC techniques or devices. Um, and then you're just providing another means for your child to communicate so that they can get their point across to everyone in their environment. As soon as we're seeing that an individual is having difficulty with their vocalization, with verbalization, we need to give the individual some way to communicate. And that can be, there's various AAC systems and programs that we can use, but the most important thing is giving a tool for the child to communicate. We really need to look at doing some sort of assessment and seeing, you know, how we can best support the individual. So sometimes it can be with just using some picture supports, and sometimes that means using an augmentative communication system like an iPad. Because if a child is not developing verbal speech as expected, they're also not developing expressive language, vocabulary, or grammar either. But by incorporating AAC, we can support the individual's communication and their language development. But I do believe that AAC should be a team decision, and it should be something that we need to start with some um, assessments and some trials to see what's the best for the individual. recommend to all my families that they start signing. I often find that even just naturally within my session, I will use sign language too, because I'm looking to provide as much input to a child while also seeing what will be successful for them. It helps reduce negative social um, behaviors. It increases social interactions and it develops cognitive structures. So when we incorporate sign language, we give children another mode of communication that doesn't rely on the verbal skills. Sign language can absolutely be a helpful tool, but there are limitations in that all the, the individuals that the child is communicating with will also need to learn sign and be able to use the sign interactively with the child. Because sign is like any other language, it, it needs to be taught and it needs to be practiced. One thing that I have seen is some of the individuals I've worked with, um, some of the kiddos, Sign because sign is motoric, and some of the kiddos that have verbal apraxia may have some motor limb or other issues that might impact their ability to effectively sign. If your child is um, impaired in their speech development or delayed in their speech development, this gives them the chance to start um, expressing themselves at an appropriate age as well. Research shows that children who learn sign language are more readily able to translate letters and words into written language. And it also indicates that learning a second language, including sign language, actually increases your IQ. So all of these things are great supports for sign language. There are so many opportunities for families to learn how to incorporate sign language into their daily routine. So there are videos like baby signing time or community classes or from their speech language pathologists. I all the time had families bringing their children to me at three years of age because I taught preschool initially. And they were concerned, if my child is using sign language, are they never going to speak? And I always said, this is a hearing world. The people around them are speaking, very few people are signing. So if we're worried about your child being able to speak, we're gonna keep pushing them and um, giving them that speech support. And as they're more verbal and more understood, that child is going to, to drop the sign language. So why not give them all the support so they can communicate while um, knowing that when they no longer need the sign language, they're not going to use that as a crutch anymore. 
you know, it, it's not a blanket statement as sign appropriate or not. It really depends on the individual needs and um, where that child is. I think this is one of my biggest questions that are asked to me by both parents and clinicians. I know the concern that if we provide access to another mode that verbal speech may not come, but we're modeling that language constantly. So when we're using AAC or we're modeling AAC, we're also modeling the verbal skills as well. By using an AAC system, we're providing another modality of communication. And we all talk in different modalities, or I should say communicate in different mod modalities. We point, we gesture, we use our facial expressions. We do all sorts of different things. You're just giving them another mode that when their speech is not reliable, that they can rely on. So really, it kind of gives them a foundation of language. It also, most importantly, gives them a way to communicate right now when verbal speech is challenging. So this is their opportunity to be able to tell us to stop. I'm tired. I need a break. I need help. An AA system does not hinder uh, your child's ability to learn to do speech movements. Um, the research shows um, that they will do whatever is the fastest and easiest method of communication. So if they're able to say a word, they're not going to go to their AAC system to use that system in order to communicate. So we have a lot of research studies now on this topic um, and that in covering a variety of different AAC systems and um, as well as tons of clinical experience. And the conclusion that has been reached over and over again is that using AAC will only facilitate your child's speech abilities um, while also having other benefits like decreasing frustration and anxiety. Research and clinical experience shows that using AAC does not interfere with a child's verbal ability, but not having a way to communicate by using tools like AAC will 100%, 150% impact their communication and language growth because they don't have a way to communicate. I often compare the struggle with incorporating AAC to a, a bottleneck. And so when we're requiring a child to only communicate through verbal skills, it can be so frustrating because if they could verbally produce it, they would, but they're struggling with the planning and the execution of the motor movements to be able to produce it. But receptively, they have so much more vocabulary going on. So when we offer another mode of communication, it alleviates some of that bottleneck and decreases the frustration because they now have a way to be able to get those needs, those wants met without having to rely on verbal skills. So I always encourage use of AAC right away. There might be a little bit of a pause and working on motor speech skills while we get that AAC system going, but just always know that our end goal is verbal speech, but our immediate goal is functional communication with everyone right now. Child should use their AAC system in all environments possible. I always caution parents, make sure that you do feel comfortable with where you're taking the device. Everywhere. When, when you leave the house, do you leave your voice at home? Do you leave your voice in your purse when you're at the grocery store? Do you leave your voice in your backpack when you are going to PE or lunch or, um, you know, the playground? No. So think about your day and think about all the opportunities that will you, you will use your voice. Our AAC user needs the opportunity to use their voice in all of those situations. If they don't have their AAC device with them, then they can't communicate. And they also can't learn how to use their AAC device in so many different opportunities. Where does a child want to communicate the most? And how do we provide access to as much vocabulary as possible? Take their AAC device everywhere. Yes, there can be issues with, I've had an AAC device go swimming. I've had an AAC device get thrown across the room. Yes, those are issues. Um, and yes, at, you know, at PE or recess, there is the opportunity for things to get broken. However, um, I have found that the times that they have gotten broken haven't typically been um, PE or recess. Disneyland is always a great example of 
just make sure that you have it with you at all times. Don't let it out of your sight, but that's also a great opportunity to practice communication with the device with your child. What that looks like depends on what is most comfortable for your family, as well as the activity that's going to be done. So I have made vocabulary boards specifically for the bathroom. I have made vocabulary boards specifically for the kitchen. Um, Whatever a family thinks is important for them to get, we can print out the homepage of a communication device and laminate that so that it can go into a backpack and head to on a hike. I've also laminated those boards or core boards onto kickboards so that they have access to the vocabulary when swimming. It just really depends on like what is most important to a family. I firmly believe that we need to have and individuals have their voice with them at all times. Going to bed, getting up, going to school, going to PE, going to the gym, going to the pool. Every context, every situation, I like to say, have it available as a means of communication. It does not need to be your child's first mode of communication, but it's always great to have it on hand for communication repair. Absolutely. We 100% encourage you to be using your AAC, your child's AAC system when you're talking with them. So children learn by watching um, the family members and people closest to them. Absolutely. Use that AAC system. It is a perfect way for you to learn how to navigate it. Introducing a new AAC system, whether it be sign language or picture symbols or a high-tech device, it can feel really overwhelming. There are so many different pictures. There's so many different options. Like as a parent, as a speech and language pathologist, you almost feel that you should be, you know, modeling the vocabulary as much as possible, but that's okay. If we want to take, you know, one word or a word of the week or a word of the day to be able to feel most comfortable. The most important part is that we're modeling the use of the device. Absolutely. I would use their AAC system um, when you're talking to them as a, as a way to model. If we think about it, you've been talking to your child since they were born and they have gotten speech models since they were tiny babies. But what children who are using AAC devices are not getting is models of other people using AAC systems. So while you're playing a game, while you're having dinner, you can model asking for the food that you want. You can model the vocabulary of the game. Uh, That's just giving your child that many more opportunities to learn language and to understand how to use their AAC system. One of my favorite things to do when I'm working with a kiddo that's just learning the device is we kind of do um, some some activities where I know we're using some some, um, words or vocabulary the individual is not going to use. So I can show the individual how we find things, how we find those words. But how are they going to learn how to do that if nobody is showing them? So we can use modeling um, very effectively for our kiddos to teach them how to explore and use their device. So when a child starts to really grasp that like using the AAC means something and that this is the vocabulary that they're able to communicate through it. One of the things that I recommend the most is that when they are using one word, you know, so they, let's just say they say more then you as a parent can model expanding it. So if they say more, you know, on their device or they point to the picture that says more, or they sign more, let's expand it by one more. So, you know, more bubbles, you know, more play, you know, what can we do to show that we can take that vocabulary and expand it? And even going beyond using it to talk to them, I like to say narrate your day with it. Sometimes that's even a little bit easier because then you're finding and navigating toward different things that your child would probably say also. So if you are in the kitchen, you can always say for yourself, oh, I'm thirsty. So you'll say it verbally with your mouth. And then you also say it with their device. I'm going to get some water. And then you go and get the water and you're modeling for your child what they could do in that same situation. So yes, use it to ask your child questions and tell them things, but also use it as an opportunity to model how they could be using it without just telling them what they should be saying. I think it's also important for me to remember when using a new device that 
I'm learning it and it's a struggle for me. And we're asking our students or we're asking our kids to do this hard work. And it's a good reminder for me that, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. And it's a good thing for me to model as well. Things do, you know, I can make a mistake and I can say, whoops, I made a mistake. Let me go back. Or I made the wrong one. And we need to model that just as much as we need to model the success. Now, some kiddos do not like to share their device, and this is something where we need to respect the fact that this is the individual's voice. So I always try to, when I'm first starting to work AAC with a kiddo, is that, you know, I will model on their device to kind of get it, you know, something so that the child is um, more used to that. But I also try to respect that fact if, you know, kids like, no, this is mine. I don't want you to touch it. So something that you can do. And I think that you should do this, whether the individual wants you to use their um, device or not, is you can take screenshots of each of the pages and you can create your own um, printed version of the device. This is a great way to have a spare in case the iPad does go into a um, koi pond, um, but also so that you can share with other individuals in the child's world so that they can talk and communicate with them as well. That really shows them that this is a completely acceptable and normal way to communicate so that they can be using speech and these other methods of communication. Wow, that was such great information on how we should be using AAC with our children, whether it's using signs, picture boards, or speech generating device such as an iPad, AAC can be a helpful tool for our Praxia stars while they're finding their voice. If you would like more information about using AAC with your Praxia star, scan this QR code to go to our parent portal, which has an article about different types of AAC, a webinar about strategies to use with AAC systems, and more. If you are using a tablet or iPad with your child, Apraxia Kids has a free speech and language app guide where you can search through a variety of app options, including communication tools, apps to help with practicing speech sounds and language, academic learning apps, and much more. Scan this QR code to download your free app guide. Thank you once again to our wonderful Apraxia Kids Bootcamp graduate SLPs for sharing all of their expertise in the area of AAC with us giving our Praxia stars a way to communicate while they keep working so hard to find their voice truly can give hope to families on their Apraxia journey. Thank you so much for watching.